Ever feel like you're doing this teaching thing alone? You don't have to be. Share Teaching is all about sharing the workload through the power of collaboration and teamwork. Together, we'll walk through all the difficult parts of teaching and learn how to streamline our processes, fine tune our time management, and develop a more manageable workload. If that sounds like a dream come true to you, then welcome to the Shared Teaching Podcast. Let's share in the teaching to make those dreams a reality. Now here's today's Shared Teaching. Hello and welcome back to the Shared Teaching Podcast. I'm your host, Susan, and you are listening to episode 59, where we're going to talk all about how to get started with literacy centers but with a gamification style twist. Okay, so if you are new here, again, I want to welcome you. Thank you for finding this podcast, and hopefully you will stick around for future episodes. And if you have been sticking around, then I would encourage you to go ahead and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts so that you can help other teachers find this episodes as well. Okay, so this is episode 59, and we're going to talk about getting started with literacy centers. Now, I mentioned the word gamification because I wrote this post kind of in a tongue-in-cheek kind of a way, making it more like a game than your traditional how to get started manual. Okay, so if you haven't heard of gamification before, it's simply a term applied to adding a game style component to the things that you do in your classroom. So for example, if you have a Jeopardy review game um, before like standardized testing or something like that, that Jeopardy game would be considered gamification because you're adding a gaming component to your classroom. If you're like me and you do the teacher versus the students, again, gamification. So why not apply this to literacy centers, right? Okay, so whatever you call your literacy centers, whether it's literacy centers, workstations, independent work practice, um, must do, may do, any of those kind of terms, it can get very challenging to get started. And I am one of those people that like to have all the information before I take action. And this usually results in me either A, putting things off because they sound so confusing and exhaustive, or B, getting all bent out of shape because I try to do all the things in capitals that just didn't work out so well. So I'm hoping this blog post or podcast episode, in your case, is going to break things down for you in an easy to implement way. Now, if you're new here, I do this podcast episode also as a blog post. So if you like to go back and reread the things I've talked about, or maybe see pictures that support some of the ideas, then you are more than welcome to go to shareteaching.com forward slash podcast, and you'll be able to see any of these episodes written out in blog post form. Okay, so I have always been a primary teacher, except for a slight veering off when I taught a gifted fourth and fifth grade classroom. And then again, I did a quick half year in a regular fourth grade classroom just teaching literacy. And I decided it was not quite for me. And that's okay sometimes in the world of teaching. And I had to learn to be okay with that because it's still kind of embarrassing saying, yeah, I only worked half a year there. But sometimes that's just the way things are. And if you want to learn more about that, I believe it's in one of my very first episodes where I talked to you all about my teaching journey, it was called. Okay, so when my literacy centers are up and running smoothly, I am in my element. And maybe you have this feeling too, when something in your classroom is just clicking and it's working and the kids are behaving and doing what they're supposed to be doing, oh my goodness, it's one of the best feelings in the world for me about teaching. So not to break too much, but I used to have other teachers from my school come to check out my literacy centers because they had heard so many great things about them and they wanted to see how I was doing it, what they looked like, and how they could also do it in their room. 
And I've also given a few professional development talks on how to use and work with setting up your centers as well. I just love, love, love literacy literacy centers, if I can even talk. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is step number one, and we want to think of your literacy center goals as levels in a game. Okay, so before you even start playing the game, right, or designing the game, you have to have the levels. So the basis to a successfully run center time is to get started with, yes, you probably guessed it, a plan. I want you to carefully think through how you want your literacy centers to look once they are running like the dream that I mentioned a minute ago. This is going to be your highest levels you want your students to unlock, right? So no matter what grade you teach, whether it's first grade or fourth grade like I used to do, your highest level is most likely that students are going to be on task they're independent, and they're quiet enough that you can hold small groups or individual conferences. So next, you want to think of all the things they need to know to get to this point. So you're thinking about the skills that they need to acquire or that they should have in order to be successful with those things that I just mentioned, the independence, the quiet, right? So you're going to teach them those things in mini lessons. They are going to need to learn other things like working like with a partner, choosing who gets to go first, especially if your literacy centers include board games and students are going through the centers as partners. And when you can and cannot be bothered during your small group teaching, what your small groups actually look like and so much more. Because if they can't recognize when you are in a group or when you are in a conference with somebody, then they're going to start interrupting you because they don't know what it looks like when you just say, hey, don't interrupt me when I'm teaching or don't interrupt me when I'm talking to this student. You might have to explicitly model what that looks like. Role play. Don't be afraid to do those things in your classroom, especially if you teach kindergarten, first grade, even second grade. I find myself having to do this a lot with my students this year is just really break things down in smaller steps and really be very cognizant of exactly what I want them to do and how they're going to get there. Okay, so spend some decent time brainstorming all the procedures they're going to need in place, things like what your quiet levels look like, right? And in order to help you with this, the Daily Five book, if you have not read it, is a really, really good book of all these mini lessons that you're going to need to be successful. So I highly recommend you find it in a library, check it out on Amazon, look on their website. But if you have not read that book, I suggest you try that. Okay, so depending on the age you teach, you may need to revisit some of these mini lessons, take a couple days to practice the same ones, or even double up on some of the others you will need to gauge with your class how much time you need, right? Because every class is unique and you know your students best. What I, so I'm not going to create a rollout plan for you, but really just think about the needs of your students and what you've already noticed so far in the school year of what they might need. Okay, so this is where you cannot plan ahead too much, right? Because you don't know how much time it's going to take. Maybe they'll be faster, maybe they'll be slower, But you do want to kind of jot down some kind of a plan about what you think you'll be doing, but always keep in mind you have to be flexible. So what is written in your plans may not be working that week or day, and you're going to just pull something out from a different day or go back to a different lesson, maybe approach it from a different angle and try again. It's okay to go off course for a day or two. Okay, the second step, so the first step was thinking of your literacy center goals as levels in a game, right? So what do you want those levels to look like? And number two is to unlock your literacy center levels slowly. So if we stick with this game analogy, your students are trying to unlock those levels to be winners. So what do most gamers need in order to get there? And I hope you said practice. Lots and lots and lots and lots of practice. 
My nephew is a gamer and he sits at the computer all hours of the day and just plays the same game. Then he analyzes his game moves in order to improve. He also talks to other players to get advice. So you are going to do the same thing in your classroom. It's important to introduce each of your literacy center stations slowly. No matter what grade level you teach, introduce only one new center each day. And you always want these centers, I think I forgot to mention this, be skills that you already have taught them. You do not want the new centers to be new material, right? They're always a review of previously taught skills. You're going to explain the rules. You're going to practice that center. You're going to watch the students practicing that center. Then you're going to gather the class and ask them what they noticed, what went well, what could be improved next time. And this process is actually taken from that Daily Five book, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Depending on the time you have available, you will either practice another day or hold another practice right away, reconvening again when finished to revisit how it went and ask for room for improvement, right? What could you do better? Don't forget to start the next practice day by reviewing what the students told you. So you want to put the ownership on the students. What are they noticing? Not necessarily what you're noticing, but you could guide them in noticing the things that you want them to notice, right? We all like to do that as a teacher. Okay, so step three now is to consider your literacy center logistics. To win the center game, you need to consider your room and set up logistics. Before you can start out rolling out literacy centers, you need to know how many centers you actually need. So you want to think about how many people will be at each center and how many times a week do you want students to visit the same center? Will you be changing centers often? I like to have my center rotations last two weeks with each center having only two students. This means there's a lot of centers going on in the room at one time or I am doubling the materials for the same center in order to have enough stations. So I like to do the two kids at a station because it cuts down on having students be off task, misbehaving, not doing what they're supposed to be doing, arguing with some of the people that are in their centers group. The smaller the group you have, the less likely you are to have those issues. So that's something to consider for sure. And you also need to know, like, how are you grouping them? Are they going to be on the same level as each other? Are you going to do like a medium low, medium high, high with a low? How do you want that to look? So you really have to think through those kind of things. And then you also need to know how much time you have for literacy centers. Once you know the time you have, you can plan how many centers and how many rotations you will do. I would suggest starting off really small if this is your first time attempting centers because you can always add on once things are running smoothly. This year, I have such a very limited time that I am only doing one rotation. I don't have time to do the fun three, five rotations. So one rotation it is for me, and I can't even call it a rotation because they just do it one time. And then the next day they go to a different center. Okay, step four is to consider the enjoyment of your players. And don't skip this part, right? Because this is very important. So when choosing your literacy center activities, you need to keep in mind alignment to your standards, but also student engagement. You're going to think again of video games. When someone finds a game they really enjoy playing, they will play it for hours. This should be your ultimate goal when you find centers that meet your students' needs. You want to hear a chorus of no (laughs) when you tell students time is up for the day. Make them enjoy your center time so much they don't want to stop. Even better, they don't feel like they are learning. And remember, they are practicing previously taught skills. This is the one key that makes centers really successful. Okay, last but not least, step number five is to reward and track your players. Gamers love to be rewarded by points or new lives they can collect as they move through the game levels. You're going to use the same idea for your students. Reward them with praise after they've had a really good literacy center session. 
You're going to randomly pass out a certificate or a sticker for a job well done. Find something that is easy for you to do and works with your teaching style. Right? Uh, my next door neighbor, teacher neighbor, has punch cards for her students, and she just simply takes a whole punch and punches cards mm-hmm. when she sees students doing something that she wants to reward them for. So you could have that as well. If they did a successful center, they completed the materials or the worksheet that went with it, you could give them a hole punch and then they trade that hole punch in for something easy. I like to do things that are not necessarily prize box toys. So things like, oh, you get to wear, you know, fun slippers for an hour in the classroom or you get to sit next to a friend. You can sit at my teacher desk. Things like that that don't cost me anything but that are really easy to just break out the reward at a moment's notice when the kid has earned it. Okay, so since we have used a game analogy throughout this whole post, we're going to keep it going with this last point of rewarding and tracking your players. So players know they are winning the game because they can track how many points they are earning and what level they are on. While you probably don't want to take this too literally for your center setup, it is important to keep a teacher log of what standards students are practicing in their centers, especially if you are differentiating. This can become helpful information as you decide when to change out your literacy centers. So I hope you found this episode incredibly helpful, and I'm just going to run through those five key points once again. So the first one is you want to think of your literacy center goals as levels in a game. The second step is to unlock your literacy center's levels slowly. This is the very key here. You want to set yourself up for future success, so go slow. Step three is to consider your literacy center logistics. Step four is to consider the enjoyment of your players. And last, step five is to reward and track your players. Okay, so as always, I would love to hear from you. What, if any, are your biggest frustrations when you're trying to implement and manage centers? Before you throw in the towel, reach out to me, leave me a comment or a message, and let me know what's going on, and maybe I can help you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, and I hope you tune in next week for another new episode of the Shared Teaching Podcast. Bye for now. If you've loved this show, then join me in sharing the teaching, hitting that subscribe button, and leaving us a review on iTunes, so we can be found by more teachers like you who are ready to start sharing the workload. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Find new episodes each week on sharedteaching.com. Thanks for listening to the Shared Teaching Podcast. Podcast.